Tonight, you're going to learn why you need to dig down and explore the wines of Prince Edward County for your own personal pleasure from one of uh, the region's most respected winemakers. He has lots of colorful stories to tell us, and so you want to stay tuned for some great entertainment. I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com, and you're here with me on the Sunday Sipper Club, where we meet every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, it's Toronto, New York time, to talk to some of the most intriguing people in the world of wine. Now, before I introduce our guest tonight, in the comments below, just let me know, have you ever tasted a Prince Edward County wine? And I'm going to refresh my browser over here because I want to know how familiar you are with the wines that we'll be tasting tonight. Hey, Lori, I'm glad you're here already. I'm assuming you guys can hear and see me. All right. So let me get on with the intros and I will keep an eye out on the comments. Excellent, Lise. Lise from Sudbury, Lynn from Ottawa. Lori, oh, you drink them all the time. Excellent. We got a lot of excitement, a lot of people piling in very early on here. I love it. So our guest this evening has a cult following in the wine world. After he graduated from the University of Dijon's sommelier program, he spent six years working as a sommelier at the prestigious Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto. Then he decided to make wine, not just serve it and spent another six years working in vineyards around the world. That was actually 12 vintages because he was working in both hemispheres, so he had a lot of training going into this. But he decided to make his home and his winery in Prince Edward County, and he joins me now live from the county. Welcome, Norm Hardy. Thank you, Natalie. Great to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So good to have you here, Norm. Now, with that introduction, fill in some details that I've left out. Tell us a little bit about your personal life so we get to know you a little bit better before we dive in here. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that people don't realize, um, most people do an apprenticeship in their late teens, early 20s. And uh, when I decided to become a winemaker, I made the big jump at the age of 30. And doing the apprenticeship route was certainly a, a very... Uh, challenging one but i felt was the best one to do you know at 30 my friends were buying houses having children getting married and here i was leaving this beautiful comfortable job at the four seasons with a great future uh heading off with a backpack and a and a, and a, and a plaid shirt and a few t-shirts and, a, and uh, some work boots to literally scour the world and go and work for the very, very best people, uh, winemakers, for not very much money in many cases, not enough, just enough money to make this sort of plane ticket to the next place. So um, there was a lot of sacrifice, but also at the same time, um, it really, you know, I, I, I felt learning from uh, the very best was the best way to go. I was, I, was, I was always that kid at the back of the class. Were you? What does that mean? <laughs> at the back of the class? I thought the keen kid was at the front of the class. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I always ended up doing quite well, but I was always that guy. I sort of hung out at the back, you know. I, I, I was With I, the cool kids. Well, I'm trying to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, That's great. Yeah, I just knew that going back to school at 30 was not the way I wanted to go. And also I okay. thought what was very important is that, you know, school and wine schools are amazing in the sense that they teach you to make wine very technically and from a very, um, in a very sound way. Um, but, but there's something that school cannot teach you and that's experience. And I felt, you know, I could, I could get enough sort of education from reading books and that sort of stuff, but really to get the sort of fine nuances and those, those smaller points and, and also the real life experience because I knew I had to open my own winery at some point. Excellent. Absolutely. So I'm just going to welcome also Peter Chandler, who's joining in from the UK and looking forward to learning about Canadian wines. Welcome, Chandler. Lise is up in Northern Ontario. Norm, Lise actually visited your winery recently, I believe, Norm. Um, oh. Yeah, Lise Gagné. And she, Norman is one of the best people working, has the best people working for him. It's like a big family. Well, that's how it feels when you visit. And I've heard many good things about um, visiting your winery, Norm. We're going to get into that pizza oven and all sorts of things. But I just wanted to welcome people here. Deb Kennedy loves Norm Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So welcome, everybody. If if you're just joining us, you're with the Sunday Sipper Club. Post in the comments below, where are you logging in for, from and what's in your glass? Or have you ever tried a Prince Edward County wine? Yes or no? 
Okay, Norm. So you gave us a little bit of a, oh, hey, Beverly from Norwalk, California. All right. So um, Norm, you gave us a bit of a taste of how you got started in the wine world, but um, was there an exact moment when it triggered in your mind, hey, I really want to make wine? Was there a place you were, something that caused you to say, I actually want to make wine, not just serve it? Um, you know, I think it was a it was a it was a time I was turning thirty, which actually had nothing to do with it. But I'd been with Four Seasons for seven years, and my next move was to go and work for either be a food and beverage director in Tokyo or in Turkey. And what I really enjoyed being was was the lead sommelier and and having a huge impact on choosing the wines for the U.S. properties. And and I really loved wine, and I. So I thought I was going to lose that, but also the other thing I had was I I tasted with a lot of great winemakers, and I I felt you know if I'm going to be a judge, I better have walked in their shoes at some point. So I thought this was a great time for me to actually um, get out there, take a year. I'm 30. I don't have any responsibilities. I've got no kids. I've got no house. I've got no mortgage. Uh, I'm doing really well with Four Seasons, and, and they're an expanding company, and, and uh, leaving them for a year, I'm sure the door would be open when I came back. And I thought, this is the time, if I'm ever going to do it, this is the time I'm going to do it. And I, I felt also from a knowledge standpoint as a somebody um, uh, that that was very important. And, and you know, now I see, which is fantastic, is in these so many programs, the students are a lot more involved in the understanding of making and the growing of wines and when I did my studies. So at that point, I thought, this is the time to do it. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. Absolutely. Yeah, those hands-on practicums, there's nothing like it. So um, even wine writers benefit from some hands-on experience, I think, Norm. <laughs> <Sure>. um, <laughs> so we know that Prince Edward County has great limestone soils and a nice cool climate, and it's on the edge of everything, um, which makes it nerve-wracking, I'm sure, to make wine. But tell us something about Prince Edward County that we don't know about. Why you chose it to make your wine? Well, I, you know, I think... We ultimately, I chose it because I'd been searching the world for these amazing clay and limestone soils. And, uh, you know, if you're in France and you talk about clay and limestone, pretty much everyone has it in their backyard. Not quite, but, you know, all the great wine regions of France are grown on clay and limestone. And so f for the French, it's, it's like the rigueur. So this is what it is. But if you look in the New World, there's very little clay and limestone where, where wines can grow. And... Uh, when I found Prince Edward County, it was like, holy moly, this is very, very special. And I said, and then I, and then the first thing that goes off in your head, okay, this is too perfect. You know, what's wrong with this place? And, and in the middle of the summer, it's pretty hard to find anything wrong with Prince Edward County. It's mm. you know, the lake moderating it. Um, you have the clay limestone soils. Uh, we have a really strong tourist base, and uh, but the you know the biggest challenge, which most people don't know about Prince Edward County and what, why it took so long to develop, is that um, every winter at some point we get minus twenty five, and wow. we're on the we're on the north shore of Lake Ontario, which in the winter is the wrong side to be. Uh, you know Niagara does so well; it doesn't have the same issues in the winter because they're on the south shore of Lake Ontario. We can be at minus 25, 27, or 29, uh, and the winds come from the north where it's super, super cold. It goes over Lake Ontario, and it warms up by 10, 12 degrees. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're so protected. So I guess you know, what a lot of people I don't think realize is, is they've come to the county. It's magnificent. It's a great, like, I think it's one of the greatest places in the world to grow grapes, except for the winter. <laughs> and that would be a problem, because that's sort of half the year or thereby <laughs> so, so, so what do you do to protect the vines against that winter kill that extreme cold that you're that you get so this is what sort of i guess until a lot of people realize we can do it economically and 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 uh, efficiently we actually bury our vines of soils and Bearing, bearing plants of soil is no new trick or new anything. You know, for those in Ottawa, uh, they bury their rose bushes. Now, at home, you have six or seven rose bushes. Uh, on the Danforth, there are many people in, in Toronto and the Greek community that have fig trees, and they literally bend them over and cover all the green tissue with soil. Okay. And, 
Now, the difference between rose bushes and vines is we have 80,000 vines. Uh -huh. So seven rose bushes, 80,000 vines. Um, you have to be able to do it fairly, you have to be able to do it mechanically and you have to be able to do it very quickly because um, you can only bury them once you've actually taken the fruit off. Okay, and are you uh, are you putting the dirt halfway up the vine or what's the, what are you trying to do? And well, you're using mechanical means to do this? For sure, we have to. So the, um, essentially what we have very different to say Niagara or California where they have a, a, a nice trunk system and everything's uh, uh, come is, is waist height. Um, all our canes come right off the head of the uh, head of the vine, mm -hmm. so everything's very close to the ground. Okay. And the whole idea is is that for each plant we tie down about between two and four canes from last year okay. onto a wire on the ground. Um, now, when you multiply three times eighty thousand, that's a quarter million. Um, and that's all very close to the groundwork. And then uh, we put the tractor through with a, with a um, cultivated loosened soil. And then eventually the tractor goes through with a V plow and it literally pushes dirt up onto the vines itself. Okay. And if you look at it, it's, um, down, if you look, look down the rows, either side of the plant, uh, it almost looks like a, it's like a big triangle of dirt that's over the plants. Okay. And when you see that tractor going down, you go, oh, my God, I wouldn't want to have my leg there, you know. <laughs> um, on the other hand, we know it works. And even, you know, I didn't, I, in Ottawa, I remember that, and you'll remember how cold it was the year of the polar vortex back mm. around six, seven years ago. And we got to minus 39. So. Oh, minus 39. What is that in Fahrenheit? I'm bad at conversions. Do you know? Minus, about minus 39. I think minus 42 they cross. Okay. So minus 39 is oh. as cold as it gets. And, uh, you know, where vines would die at minus 25, oh. uh, uh, when the, what, what the soil told us is that a few inches of soil over those plants uh, allowed, us, allowed them to survive. So it, burying them or burying them, we call it hilling up with soil, uh, really works. It, it certainly adds a lot of cost. And, you know, what also it, you have to be very efficient at it because the time between picking the grapes and when you can cultivate and bury your plants is very small because winter comes quickly. So right. if your plants are not buried by November 15th, then those windows of opportunity to bury them get smaller and smaller. Wow, that's a good theme. Winter is coming. Okay. <laughs> the game of canes, I guess. Um, I just want to welcome Lori. She's uh, drinking a Niagara Riesling tonight <coughs> with pork wow. roast. Mm -hmm. wow. Emily, Emily, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Patanod is drinking a Prince Edward County right now. Old Third, I believe it is. Simon Wong, hi Norman, we'll visit you soon from your friend Simon. Simon Wong, I guess you know him. All right, we're through the Four Seasons. <laughs> ah, excellent, terrific. And Lise is saying she's drinking Huff Estate Riesling. Um, and I drank all my hearty wine, so now I need to come back. We had a lovely day on the boat in Northern Ontario today. Excellent, Lise. So, you know what, I also notice a very, uh, very much a collegiality between the winemakers in Prince Edward County. You seem to all support each other. Um, so uh, that I, I think you take the attitude of the rising tide lifts all the boats. So anyway, um, that's just my observation, but. Uh, we, we have to. Yeah, we have to. yeah, especially when you're a small region, you've got to band together, I think, really. Yeah, there's no, the very, it's funny in the wine industry, you'd expect jealousies and things, but there's, uh, in our community, it's it's amazing if, if uh, someone's in trouble, we all band together and help. And, and uh, you know, it's it's not easy where we are, um, but um, we're there because you know those the soils are so amazing. The summer climate is so incredible, especially in this this day and age of sort of climate change and global global warming. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a lot going for us, but certainly you know we are a young region and we need to stick together. Absolutely. And how do you think um, uh, climate change is affecting Prince Edward County? Have you seen real tangible impacts um, <clears throat> well, in the county? I think we we kind of blessed in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that we're right next to Lake Ontario. And a lot of people don't realize actually how deep Lake Ontario is. And it's, it's like being next to a small ocean. How deep is it, so, by the way? I, I don't know, but I can tell you, you can't swim in Lake Ontario until July 1st. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, I think after Lake Superior, it's the second deepest lake. Anyhow, so, so the lake is beautiful and cold, and having that next, next to us has a huge mitigating effect on on the super hot days. Like I, I can certainly be in my at the farm and leave at minus twenty at plus twenty eight, and an hour and a half later I'm in Toronto, or two hours later I'm in Toronto and it's plus thirty five, plus thirty six. Oh wow! So it has that really intense cooling effect. That's yeah, a, quite a yeah. delta. Yeah, yeah, it really does, and and. If you're very close to the lake, um, uh, like we, I, we close, and there's a farm that I draw some peanut and water from, that's right on the lake. Um, so we a kilometer and a half from the lake, they're right on the lake, and we get the fruit from them two weeks later. That's the effect oh, of it. It's wow, amazing. That's profound. But so, going back to your question, is, you know, how does it help us? So I think having having uh, I call it big blue next to us, Lake Ontario. Um, it, it really has mitigated. Um, I think from a temperature standpoint, those super hot summers. But, you know, I have noticed, there's no question, uh, when the wind blows, that either it doesn't blow at all or it blows harder. Uh, when we get storms, they tend to be a lot greater. Um, there's more hail, there's more wind. So I, I, I'm finding the, 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 the climate more sort of tempestuous. And, and when things happen, they really happen. Like so last, it's extreme weather events. It's more extreme weather. And, yep. and, and sometimes prolonged events, like... Okay. Last summer, it didn't rain until August 3rd. Huh. This year, it rained every day till August 3rd. Not yeah. quite, but yeah. Oh, it felt like it. It felt like it. So we're seeing um, there's no more normal, I don't find. Uh, so we, we, what we have to do is we have to walk, work very carefully with the, with the non-normal and, and work with Mother Nature as opposed to saying, well, this is what Mother Nature is going to do and this is what we're going to do. All right. Okay. So Ro Romain Gagné is asking, can we get your wine in BC, Norm? Uh, fortunately today you can, if you order online. Order online, direct. Okay. That's right. And we can ship it out to BC. Uh, we don't have any distribution there because we haven't had enough wine there. I had enough wine to get there yet. Sure. Okay. And Lori is saying, what do you attribute your Chardonnay aromas to? It's a bit different from other shards. She's a fan of your wine, so this comes from a good place. Well, um, I'll, I'll try and sort of squeeze a, 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 a forty-five minute lecture into, <laughs> into thirty seconds. Um, so, a couple of things that we do very differently is for our Chardonnays, we use one hundred percent indigenous yeast. So, we use yeast that come from the field. We actually culture yeast from each field each year, and I think that has a huge impact. Uh, when you buy a, 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 um, a, a yeast from, from Scott Laboratories to look for, um, there are certain yeast strains that give you certain flavor profiles. And uh, by using uh, a non, uh, an indigenous yeast, we certainly get a different flavor profile. That's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is that we do ferment with a lot of solids, um, a lot of lees, a lot of um, uh, when we rack our juice after pressing after pressing we settle the juice nicely for about five days and when we take it off the clear juice we take a lot of the solids from the bottom as well uh so with those two i'd say those two are the are the major uh contributors to the nose and, and certainly to the texture of our wines okay great and uh let's see lees is asking this summer has been so wet what do you predict for your 2017 vintage well, I'm I'm hoping I'm predicting a lovely dry fall. No, <laughs> you're hoping. I, I'm hoping. Um, you know, I, I think the sky has to run out of uh, run out of water at some. <laughs> and certainly, the last ten days, twelve days, we've gone back to fairly normal um, uh, rainfalls and and temperatures. It's going to be a later harvest for sure. Okay. Uh, I we're just getting the raisin and our pinots right now, so it, it's going to be later. Um, However, some of the best uh, wines we've ever made have come from vintages like this, which have been sort of cold and rainy until sort of the beginning of August, middle of August, and then it's dried out and, and, and we've had a good protracted fall. And, you know, the nice thing is, is we can let Pianoir and, and Chardonnay hang until mid, late October if we have to, to get it ripe. So I'm not, I'm not concerned at all. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic in, in, in the years that we've had uh, weather like this, we've made some of our best wine. We're going to have to keep our head down and keep working, but it seems to work. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, okay, and Peter Chandler, I just noticed that we can buy your wines from the Wine Society this week. Which Chardonnay would you recommend? 
the 2013 or the 2014? I, I think they're both amazing. I'd say the 13 is drinking a little bit better than the 14 at this point. Um, okay. Not to say the 14 will, will, will end up with the same strength as the 13, but uh, the, the 13 is in a lovely, lovely position at the moment. So if you can grab some 13, I would. And if you can't grab the 13, the 14 is equally, maybe you just have to store it, store it in your cellar for an extra six months or so. Okay, awesome. Let's see, um, we've got a few more questions here. Gail Johnson, unfortunately she hasn't had a chance to try Prince Edward County. She lives in Niagara and tries to support local. Prince Edward County is coming soon to her glass, to Gail Johnson's glass. Excellent. Deb, had, Deb Kennedy has had lots of Prince Edward County wines. And Romaine asks, What's, what makes your Pinot Noir so special compared to French Burgundy Pinot Noir? Um, well, that's, that's another 45 minute answer. <laughs> Just feel free to condense. Uh, no, we will. Um, you know, I think one of the things we do very well is, um, and the French do it as well, is we work very, very hard in our farming. Um, ultimately, you know, your your end result starts with the potential of your with your grapes, and yeah. so we we are, we've chosen some beautiful sites, and uh, and grow the grapes beautifully. So, you know, I think. You know, what we try to do is every process is to do it perfectly and to do it well. Um, one of the things that we do have in uh, great, in, in sort of common with the French uh, great pinots from Burgundy um, is that we we get phenolic ripeness, flavor ripeness ahead of sugar ripeness. And with that, that allows us to get these amazing flavors, sort of great richness without the wines being fat and flabby and over alcoholic. Okay, well, good answer. Okay, and... Um... Let's see, what, uh, you know, apart from, of course, tasting lots of different wines from Prince Edward County and visiting the region, is there any other advice you give to our community here tonight to really get to know the county? Well, I think visiting is, is certainly the best thing. You know, the county has so much to offer. Um, you know, we have a great arts community. We have amazing food, we have tremendous beaches. And the reality is, is that we're only four and a half hours from Montreal, three hours from Ottawa, yeah. and two hours from Toronto. Um, so, and and the county is now set up for tourists and there's beautiful bicycling. So the that's the first way. And then the second way is obviously if you have access to, or you in, in, in the LCBO, um, certainly, uh, you know, buying wines from, 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 from their area would be very helpful as well. And then also there are a few really like, you know, from a, from a flavor standpoint, you have Fifth Town Cheese now sells the cheeses in different shops and uh, stores like Pusateries and higher end cheese shops and things like that. So you get, you can get a good flavor of the county, but the best thing is to come, you know, this, yeah. and it's so close. It is. And yeah. they should definitely make a pit stop at your uh, tasting room, et cetera. Okay. So you have to tell us about this outdoor pizza making oven. First of all, where'd you get the idea to build that and um, tell us about it? So about eight years ago, I called up um, the ex-corporate food and beverage director for Four Seasons. I'd, I'd worked for him, I had, a, I had good contact and in all my travels, he was very supportive and communicative and and so we kept good communications and I, he, I had heard he had just retired and I called him up and I said Alphonse you must be really bored at the moment having spent 180 days of your life in airplanes now you're stuck in Toronto so why don't you come up to the farm um, and he said well I don't know anything about wineries or anything I said well Alphonse you put two three Michelin star restaurants into one hotel in, in Hong Kong there's some chutzpah in your head. So come up to the farm and spend a day with us. And at the end of the day, he said, I'm not going to tell you about your winemaking. You're doing really well. I'm not going to tell you about your packaging. It's very good. But I'm going to tell you the three things that you need to do. The first thing he said, you need to, not now, but you need to tidy up the property. But you don't have anyone to do that now. You don't have money and you're boutique and you're small. Uh, so when you have some money, you do it. So anyhow, now we paint the building and we cut the grass, and it, it doesn't look like a it doesn't look like a golf course. We're in the country, but it's it's nice and it's cared for. The second thing he said, you need to sell other stuff um, from apart from wine, and now we have we sell some beautiful like nice merchandise and and all local from our friends, and most of it from the county from artisans. And the third thing he said, you know, Norm, you really have to do 
some food. You were really good with food. And I went, well, I ran away from Four Seasons not to do food. And uh, so anyhow, he pushed it and he said, you know, what's important is, is with food, people will remember your place. They will sit, they will, he said, you have amazing energy. You've got this young staff. You, people love, what you have here is magical and you need people to sit down and just suck it up and see it. And so I thought long and hard about doing food. And, you know, we have to realize we're in the country. We don't have a lot of skilled cooks, all that sort of stuff. And it was just the rise of Pizza Libretto, the Neapolitan wood-fired pizza in Toronto. And Toronis have been doing it for years. And, and Libretto started this slightly wetter Neapolitan style. And I thought, this is perfect. Um, everyone loves pizza. We have lots of kids. You can be kid-friendly. And I also really wanted to make um, our, my place accessible to, to everyone. Mm. You know, wine is a very intimidating thing. And if you make it accessible, then it's not intimidating. So, right. And pizza is not, ex is not snobby. It's not the snobby. ultimate inaccessible food. Exactly. Yeah. So I thought, why don't we do pizza? And then, and uh, so that's, you know, I have to thank pizza libretto in Toronto because they're the ones that sort of tweak the mind. And, and then the other great thing is with pizza, you can train people very quickly on how to, to make great pizza. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a super skill set like our pizza team this year. Only two of the two of the three of the eight in the kitchen this year were in the kitchen last year, mm -hmm. uh, and we've had the best year ever. And the quality of our pizza has been the best. And, and this is not supposed to sound like an infomercial, but I'm trying to illustrate that we can train up people on making great pizza very quickly. So finding it's practical, from the, yeah, very from a, from a labor standpoint, in drawing upon young kids who have low skill levels in kitchens. Mm -hmm give them skills and, and, and do something really, really well. That's really smart. Yeah. And, and last thing is, you know, as I said, everyone likes pizza. Kids love pizza. Adults love pizza. And the other great thing is you got to look at fires. Fire, the hearth. Mm -hmm. Even in the middle of the summer, people are attracted to fire. And there's something about, uh, about cooking with fire. And, and, and so when people see uh, their pizza get cooked with fire, it kind of warms the soul. Yeah. It's tribal. It's communal. Everybody gathers around. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, it also, the pizza oven's fantastic. It really helps us cook our food a little quicker, our staff meal at the end of the day as well. <laughs> Do you have pizza every day? No, we, we don't. By this time of year, everyone's sick and tired of pizza, but <laughs> I, I, I try once a week to get together with my staff at the end of the day, normally on a Monday, and cook them something out of the pizza oven. We'll either roast some chickens in there or whatever, and everyone loves that as well. They like, it, they like it when the boss cooks. <laughs> That's great. And what are your favorite pizza and wine pairings? So, for example, what would you pair with your Pinot Noir? Which type of pizza? Um, right now, uh, I, I, would, I would pair our, our, it's called the Argente. And for lack of a better term, it's the adult pepperoni pizza. Um, Why do you call it adult? Adults, because the pepperoni... Uh, the pepperoni doesn't come from a large manufacturer. It's come from seed to sausage in Ottawa. Okay, and that makes right. it adult. Well, it's 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 a great. Um, it's like a it's it's a it's a it's a beautifully cured pepperoni. Oh, all grown up and sophisticated. Yeah, all grown up sophisticated. And instead of using ch cheddar cheese or 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 bad mozzarella. Uh, there's a buffalo farm just north of the county in Sterling that does pure buffalo mozzarella. And we use that local pure buffalo mozzarella on that pizza. So I kind of joke that it's the adult version of the, uh, of, of, the uh, of, of a pepperoni, of a traditional pepperoni pizza you find from pizza. Yeah, I got to agree with that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Lori is asking, what is it you like, um, what do you enjoy more about winemaking than you did being a sommelier, what is the deciding factor for you? Well, I think a couple things. Um, uh, I'm creating something, uh, whereas in sommelier you're just judging. Okay. And um, you know, I find uh, I, I also think it's wonderful as a sommelier I'd just being myself. Today I have a payroll in the summer of over fifty people, mm -hmm. so the winery has allowed us to employ fifty people at Prince wow. That wasn't in the summer, um, but also I love the variance of my life. Um, if you look at um, being a sommelier, you choose wines and you go to work and you serve. Uh, my job, 
what we do is we we grew, we plant, we grow, we harvest, we manufacture, or we ferment, uh, we we age, we package, and we sell. So there's seven major steps in in making wine and getting it to market and, and collecting the money for the wine. And in your day, my day is so varied. I could be meeting with a bottle supplier. Then I'm out in the field with normally early in the morning out in the field with Mark Gilbert, my, my viticulturalist, being with a bottle supplier. Then we've got some clients coming. Then, uh, then I could be... Uh, back in Toronto and doing a, a meeting with some, some customers and or doing a winemaking. So the, the day is completely varied. And, and also, I'm a great fan of the outdoors. And being a sommelier, you spend a lot of time inside. Mm. And, uh, you know, people don't believe that I used to, like, blow dry my hair and wear suits. They find it. Like, I got dressed up today. I have a college shirt on. Yeah? You're looking very spiffy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, you know, I think, I think the very variation... Uh, Creating something that's very special, taking something like taking a, a, a piece of earth and taking and turning it into liquid in, in the glass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. And so um, this sort of picks up on, uh, I believe it's Lynn's question. Um, you've had, I'm sure you've had the opportunity to try the world's best wines. Most me what are the most memorable wines you've had? And I would just add on to that, like, who is the winemaker you admire most in the world? And why, aside from the fact they make great wines? Um, it's, you know, it's hard to pin down one, but if I was to say one, I would say is a gentleman called Dean Shaw. And Dean is a winemaker in New Zealand who I worked for for two seasons. And um, Dean is the guy I learned the most from. And, and uh, Dean is the magical ability to make wines very technically sound, but rustic at the same time. And uh, he... What does rustic mean to you? Just let's define that for a minute. So rustic, not polished. You know, today wines are often so polished and, you know, there's a very good, there's a, there's a market for that. I think it's important. So, you know, I find that polished New, New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, they're very consistent year in, year out. Right. And there's a great market for those. And, and I'll get back to the rustic in a second. Okay. And, and I'm not knocking those wines that are manufactured, that are, those wines that are made in, in the same style every year to taste the same because there's a big market out there. I have I had dinner with my lovely ex-wife who is amazing. And uh, I know a lot of people are saying, like, you're crazy, but I have an amazing ex-wife. <laughs> and, and she's very well educated and we... we uh, we lived together for 10 years and we, and we drank a lot of great wines. And I was over at her house um, having dinner with my children. And I saw her drinking a fairly commercial um, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And instead of saying, you know, why are you drinking that? I kind of said, oh, you enjoy that? And she goes, I do. I, you know, I said, well, why? She said, because it tastes the same all the time. It's consistent. Consistent. And, and there's, there's a big market for consistent wines. Um, for me, I rather make wines that are more of the soil. They play into the vintage. There's an inconsistency, uh, but there's not an inconsistency in quality. There's an inconsistency in you're going to get the same flavor every year. Right. And um, so with Dean, it being able to make, he really taught me how to work with wines on the edge to push them without them falling over, uh, without uh, wines to really, um, how to get them to express themselves uh, or the vintage of the soils the best way they could. Um, and always with a little bit of a scientific mind looking back. So, you know, um, th that's that was, to me, I think he is pretty magical. Um, uh, there are a few others. I think um, Michael Wiersing from Pyramid Valley Vineyards in New Zealand, uh, I think, is another great Pyramid. one. Pyramid, okay. And, so, and Dean Shaw, where was he from? So he works at the Central Otago Wine Company, which okay. is the most unglamorous yeah. name I've ever heard. But he makes wines for a number of different clients, including Two Paddocks, which is Sam Neill, the actor. Uh, yes. Wine. It was and in Deadcom and all kinds yeah. of other movies. Uh, Jurassic Park, yeah. Jurassic Park, and, and, and those are some of the best wines that come out of Central Otago. So mm. he, he was a big one. Um, you know, I, I worked for a lot of one. You know, I think Pascal Marchand, uh, uh, who I'm sure you know, he's a, originally from Montreal, and 
he uh, he lives in, in he's been in Burgundy for thirty five years. Scott was a great influence, and I think he you know he. He took he he had it was a huge influence in in changing many approaches in Burgundy today. And where is he now? So he works for himself, and he works with Maury Taws as well. Right, so, they have a collaboration. But is he based uh, in Burgundy? He's based in Burgundy. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And so he 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 works uh, him and him and Maury have a uh, a collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, which he makes magnificent wines with. Um, but I think in every region you've got to kind of look at you know I. I, I have my, I have my sort of um, my favorite in e each region, and you know there are many regions. But you know, I think uh, um, uh, Oregon was a guy called Russ Rainey. He was the guy I worked with, and he was the first person doing biodynamic and organic. And, and which winery was that? And it was called Evesham Wood. Um, okay. which we see their wines once in a while here, but yeah. not for often. No, right, exactly. All right, so. Now, I, I should, before, I don't want to run out of time here, we should just taste. Which wine do you have there, Norm? I've got Riesling, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. So. Oh, excellent. What a happy coincidence. So do I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which one should we start with first? Why don't we start with a little bit of Riesling? I don't know. Wait. All right. Yeah. Okay, so here's the Riesling, folks. And I have posted all of these wines and the link to them in the comments section below. Let me know if you've tasted any of these. I'd be curious if anybody's had experience with any of the wines we're tasting tonight. So the Riesling's up first. And is this a blend? It just says Ontario. So does that mean it's a blend from various vineyards around? So this, is a, this is a blend of, of Niagara and Prince Edward County. And ah, okay. it's one of the few um, wine one of the few varietals that I actually do a blend. I normally bottle the county separately and sure. Niagara separately. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, this is the one where I feel that some of the parts are great in the individuals. The county the county gives us beautiful minerality and lemon lime. And then the Niagara just puts us, sort of softens the edges and gives some dark, it gives some sort of richer fruits. So you kind of get this freshness, but a nice richness at the same time. It's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> And this oh rocks 11 and a half percent alcohol, so nice. And I know, I, I love that. It's packed with flavor, which satisfies hedonists, and yet this low alcohol makes it enjoyable throughout the evening as opposed to falling asleep at seven. You exactly. know? <laughs> well, we're waking up and having to drink some more, you know? <laughs> Haven't done that yet, but no, no. I'll take that under advisement. But this is just beautiful. It's vibrant, it's, it's light, but so char characterful. Flavorful. I have a lovely, very quick story on this. Yes, um, please. We never, we never used to make Riesling, and and when I first came to Ontario, I was going to just produce Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and then I realized very quickly what potential we had for Riesling, both in the county and then also um, seeing what they were doing in Niagara. And so I thought I have to make some Riesling in Ontario. Okay. Uh, and having been just a Pinot Noir and Chardonnay house, it was. Um, uh, it was a big step, and what really helped with us was when Anthony Bourdain, uh, parts unknown, was in Montreal, and uh, they were sitting on the ice rink behind Joe Beef, and then on national television, out of the ice rink, out of the ice bucket came this bottle of Norman Hardy Riesling. Really? And and then David McMillan poured poured Anthony a glass, and uh, <laughs> Bourdain goes, "What is this?" And uh, <laughs> And David goes, it's Norman Hardy's Riesling. It's just grown four hours from here. And he goes, that's impossible. It's so delicious. Give me another glass. <laughs> Down the hat. <laughs> what an endorsement. <coughs> Anthony Bourdain tells it like it is, Mr. Kitchen Confidential. And, of course, he's oh, yeah. got the TV shows now. But, and, wow. And what came out of that was, uh, obviously, it, it gave us great credibility in what we did. But our New York agent who sold our Pierre Noir and Chardonnay, uh, never used to take our Riesling and going, oh, no, no, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay is what we do well. The next day, we got an order from him. Excellent. Uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then about eight weeks later, um, Eric Asimov from the New York Times is in a little wine bar in Tribeca and tastes it and pulls out his camera and Instagrams it to the world. So, so the Riesling has, uh, has gone from zero cases to a very important part of what we do. Wow. Is that that wine bar run by, uh, what's his name? He was a former Paul, Canadian? Paul Greco. Is yeah. that where it was? Yeah, it was there, to work. Yeah. He's Yay, been on, good on Paul. He, he yeah. really is a great advocate for Rieslings and, and Canada. 
Yeah, he's got wrestling tattooed all over his arm. I yeah. know, he's a bit crazy, but we yeah, should have him on this show, actually. <laughs> okay, so this is beautiful. Let's make sure, though, that we taste the others. Um, shall we go to the Chardonnay next? Is that... Sure. Let's go to some Chardonnay. Okay, let me show it to the folks. And again, the links are below in the comments section. Has anyone had the Chardonnay from Norm, Norm Hardy? We are tasting Niagara. Um, of course, he produces one in the county. This might be a good segue to say why we're not tasting county wines tonight, even though we're talking county, Norm. Well, um, you know, one of the, I've always firmly believed the best wines have always been made on the edge. Um, mm -hmm. And going to the county, that's what it is. And one of being on the edge is frost is a, is a reality. And in 2015, on May 23rd, we had a killer frost that came through and it, it pretty much took the whole crop. The whole crop. You yeah. had nothing, virtually nothing. 10% of what we normally do. Oh, that is just heartbreaking. And, and um, so that's one of the many reasons why um, I use Niagara fruit as well. But also, I also like to put into perspective is that I think, you know, I kind of look at Niagara as, 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 as Sonoma and, and Napa. And if you were in Napa and someone offered you some of the most amazing fruit from Sonoma, would you say no? Absolutely not. And uh, so, you know, I feel very strongly about both appellations. The wineries in in Prince in Prince Edward County, mm -hmm. um, but um, I think you know we make some amazing make some amazing wines from Niagara as well. I, I do feel very blessed to be in the county because it is just such a beautiful place. And I also feel you know what, one of the reasons why I ended up in in the county is I knew I could I wanted to make Niagara grapes, but if I was in Niagara, I could never get county fruit. Ah. If I had gone to the county and planted my own vineyards um, there, then I was at least guaranteed some county fruit, and then I could I could um, uh, I could contract in, or you know, we we actually lease a lot of properties, um, so we grow everything to our specs in Niagara. So, so a long story short is that um, I think some of the best sites uh, we have years we have tremendous frosts so would we'll mitigate like every farmer you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And you know, if we if we had if we had um, been a hundred percent county, we would never have been able to get the quality fruit we need in fifteen from Niagara, and that's, that's nice. what we've been for a while. So it's like an investment strategy, portfolio, a diversification. Diversification. Grapes and stocks. So this is lovely. Mm. I always love the hazelnut on the nose and mm. just the richness, and yet it's got this nervy energy through it too. It's just lovely. How would you describe it? Well, I, you know, I think we, we kind of make Chardonnay for people who traditionally don't like Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, How you know, is that? Well, for, and a lot of people don't like Chardonnay because a lot of the New World Chardonnays are made with big oak, very oily, very soft, very round. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, our Chardonnay is a lot more traditionally in the sort of Burgundian model. And um, so we they're not oaky, uh, they're not round, they're not soft. Uh, there's a great nerves, nervousness to our Chardonnays. There's a great energy. And there's a richness in flavor without the wines being oily and fat. Yeah. Yeah, wine's on the edge of a nervous breakdown. It's like <laughs> people are interesting like that too. <laughs> you want to get them just before they go over the edge. Exactly. <laughs> best story. So folks, I'm not ignoring your comments. We're having such a great conversation, but repost your questions and comments if I miss them, because I can only see four or five at a time and they're going by quite quickly. Jen has joined us. What a great story. Your Riesling Norm is wonderful. So glad it's getting recognition. Lee says, I saw Norm tank a beer I, I brought to him. He's my kind of guy. <laughs> okay. And Lisa's uh, saying his unfiltered Chardonnay is one of her faves. Lori, he's, she's had both your Chardonnays and Pinots from the Niagara and the county, so she's tasted widely. So, all right, let's make sure we also taste this Pinot, Norm. Um, I'm going to hold that one up. I love your Pinots. Personally, I'm a Pinot fan. It's what I drink for pleasure. It's Yours? A, it's a, I, it is my, my uh, you know, it is my favorite red varietal, I have to say. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. What is it about Pinot that you're drawn to, other than perhaps being a masochist who likes to flirt well, with? <laughs> well, you took my first answer right away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, you know, there's something about Pinot. Um, once, it, once it catches you, it, you're kind of done. Um, yeah. your life will be happy, but you'll be somewhat poorer financially. It's like a bad boyfriend. You just keep yeah. coming back. It's like, yeah. stop. 
<laughs> Stop. No, there's, but there's something intrinsic you like about them. Um, you know, when Pinot is great, um, it is so lovely. And then so you buy some, and then you go, oh, there must be some others. You know? And you can go through 10 bad ones until you find another great one. Yeah. And, you know, when Pinot's like great Chardonnay, there's a great richness, there's a delicacy, there's a length in these wines. Without the wines being oily and fat and boring and tiring and fatiguing. And, you know, for me, great Pinot is one that, you know, you is amazing with food. But you, while preparing dinner, you may actually have to get a second bottle. The first one disappears. I know. That's weird. It's very, I don't know if it's slippery or, or what. But <laughs> Deb Kennedy says, um, having had several of Norm's Chardonnays from Niagara in the County, love them all. Among my favorites, but the favorite is the Cuvée de Roche. Roche? Yeah. Roche? De, de Roche, yeah. yeah. What's that? Uh, I actually haven't heard of that one. So the Well, Roche. once in a while we make some, uni I call them unicorn wines. Um, they don't happen very often. And it Cuvée de Roche was a, it's a Niagara, um, uh, mainly made out of Niagara fruit. It was a ferment that was tremendously difficult. It's one of those ones where we were fighting the edge and kind of feeling is all the way through the ferment. Our, 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 we we're like on a precipice and our, our fingers were about to just slip and we we're about to go down the edge. And at the last, last moment after maybe eight months in barrel, the wine just turned around and and it was just it is so lovely and it, it, it ends up being we call it cuvée de roche because it actually tastes like rocks it is so mineral roche oh so french word for rocks oh, rock yeah, yeah roche yeah okay. so the french word for uh, uh, rocks is uh, roche no. so we we, uh, we could, because it was so mineral it, it, it's almost you, you sip it and imagine sipping water that just came off the face of a waterfall Mm. That's how pure and mineral it tastes. Mm. Okay. So I hate to say there's not much of that left. Of um, course. <laughs> uh, it was a unicorn wine. We'll most surely make another one down the, down the road, but nice. uh, um, Mother Nature will determine that, not me. Okay, so you're taking us to the edge of... <gasps> And no, you can't have it. <laughs> anyway, no, there's a little bit. You can order online. There's a little bit, but not much left. Okay. All yeah. right. So we will post your website address and all of those good details at the end so that people can contact the winery directly to order whatever it is you have left. I'm sure we'll clear the shelves tonight. Um, Paul, uh, let's see. Oh, Paul says there's a phenomenon of natural evaporation that occurs only with Pinot Noir. Have you found that? No, I haven't. I'd love to. I gotta, I gotta look that up. I, no, I know. Oh, the natural evaporation in the glass. Yeah. Yes. Yes. When when the when the wine's good, I, I sometimes I think I have a hole in my glass as well. It's not even the evaporation. Yeah. I think I'm buying the same glassware. Yeah, I think so. I we buy expensive glassware, but yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> Mark Savard uh, says, "Do you have any other special wines coming up? Any special edition wines that you're making or planning to make right now?" Yeah, we've done a couple of things, particularly this year. Um, we wake our wines in a very natural approach and natural yeast and very low sulfurs. And we've just released two um, uh, uh, wines that have zero sulfur and never, never had any sulfur. And uh, they called, it's the Chardonnay Sans Souf. And then uh, we did the Cabernet Franc Sans Souf. What does Sans Souf mean? So Sans Souf um, means uh, uh, without sulfur. Okay. And uh, and with that, um, it's interesting. When when I was doing the labeling, I I had one of my uh, French employees um, proofread it, and they said, "Are you making a wine because we spelled it with a double F without suffering?" <laughs> so we had a double <laughs> Not F. Possible. So, <laughs> not possible. So uh, anyhow, so sans, Chardonnay Sans Souf. Uh, so these wines are, are brand new to us um, and. Very exciting as we've sort of we've always worked with very little, very little sulfur, and now we've, we've had the ability once in a while. Mother Nature gives us this uh, this chance to work with with, with wine and, and have zero sulfur in there. Excellent. And will these uh, wines without sulfur will they sell or will they keep? Will they travel or should they be sort of consumed pretty soon on purchase? I, I would say they're delicious now, and because they don't have sulfur, they may have an 
they might have a the, the age the life lifespan is not going to be as long. Okay. Um, uh, I always say you know I, especially these wines drink them young. Um, right. And you know they're going to be they still will be good for another year year and a half. But I would I drink I always say drink wine on the on the way up. You know it seems to be a, it seems to be a, a nice slow curve to the top and then a very steep a steep curve off, off the bottom. So yeah. it's always best to catch it on the way up. Yeah, absolutely. Like people again. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, do you also make an orange wine? Uh, we have made two last year. And what are they called? Uh, so one uh, one is going to called uh, Cuvée Ponton. Uh, Ponton is a uh, is a it's a play on a uh, a small what is it um, I don't want to say barge is not quite the word um, translated. Um, it's uh, just a nice very flat boat that you see on 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 the lake system, and we call it Cuvée Ponton because that's the one when you're sitting on the lake and you're fishing and you're really not catching very much because <laughs> you'd rather be drinking the wine. Um, and that was a that was a Pinot Gris which we had on the skins for about 10 days before we pressed off. And then the other one that we're going to be releasing is called Cuvée Tornado. Oh. And, and there's a great story behind this. In uh, the, When the first lot of Pinot Gris came in last year, uh, we loaded the press, and then this tornado watch came, and we literally uh, we started pressing, and then the winds came up, and I was like getting nervous, and it was a real threat of tornado and these high winds. So I said to the staff, "We're going to shut the press, we're going to enter the juice tray, we're going to cover the press with the tarp, and uh, for the night, we're going to turn off the power because." Uh, the three phases is a dangerous thing with tornadoes. And uh, the next morning we came back and we started the press up and this beautiful skin macerated juice came out of the press. And I thought, well, I'm not going to throw this out. I'm going to try and do something interesting. So we put all the, we put the juice to, um, uh, to some old French oak barrels and they fermented naturally on their own. And uh, so it's going to be called Cuvée Tornado because... Wow. It, made, it, it, it was a bit of an accident, but it, it's worked out really well. Accidents are how we get most of the inventions and new ideas in life. So, yeah, that's a unicorn wine for sure. That's the unicorn wine for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Anne-Marie Chivers is here, so welcome, Anne-Marie. She was asking Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris. I'm not sure. Clarify your question there, Anne-Marie. It's so good to have you here with us. Um, so, Norm, some quick questions for you. What's the normatory? Okay, so the Normatory was a, we had a lot of volunteers and goodwill people who wanted to come and help. So we used, we still have a bunk room. Uh, it used to have 18 beds in, I think it was like nine double bunks. And it was literally like staying at the, mil, like being in the military, except for the food and the wine was way better. <laughs> And, 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 and the curfew didn't tend to be, the start time is about the same, about 5.36, except for there was no curfew and the finish time often used to be about three in the morning because oh my goodness. Yeah. volunteers, so. They were helping you pick grapes? They helped us pick grapes. They, they helped give them a bed. Yeah, I give them a bed, or they helped them, um, uh, helped us during the year, tasting bar, pizza oven, whatever we needed. We've had a, a huge, huge support of, of, of friends, and 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 uh, so that's that's where the nor the door instead of the dormitory, it's called the dormitory. dormitory. I like it. It's like, adult, it's like an adult. It's like an adult frat house, yeah. <laughs> a result, a resort with nothing included. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, let me just throw some wild zingers at you. Um, what is the harshest criticism you've received about your wines? Well, I, I, I used to take it personally, but, um, you know, some of the greatest wines, the, I have difficulty getting through the VQA because they don't smell or taste like Ontario. Okay. And uh, Why is that? Well, you know, the... I think the, the the box in which the tastes have been sort of um, trained to taste and what to look for um, is fairly narrow, and our wines fall outside of the boxes there. And I I used to I used to take it very personally, and uh, over time your, your skin gets thick. Um, I, Fortunately, eventually, through many tasting panels and hundreds of extra dollars, we've we've always managed to get our wines through, one way or another. Um, but I, 
so I, I guess those those are the ones that used to hurt the most. Hmm. Um, you know, I hear sometimes, you know, a lot of, um, you know, when people say your, your wine's not oak enough, I, I would never take that as a criticism. It's just, that's the style of wine you like and we do something differently. So um, you, you tend, in this business, you tend to have to have a bit of Teflon on your body, otherwise you don't survive. Well, you're a cool climate winemaker, so you would naturally have thicker skin. I certainly, I got the thickest skin and my stomach seems to be thicker every year, so. <laughs> it's good protection, Norm, it's really, it's good for you. <laughs> yeah. um, so what's one thing that you believe right now that uh, other people think is insane? Well, I think uh, in what we're doing, I, I think that a lot of people still think we're insane in what we're doing, uh, what we, what, you know, on what we're pushing the boundaries. I think, like, for example, doing the no sulfur, they thought we were insane. Um, I, you know, I, I would like to see, um, you know, what I think is insane in our industry is, is I think there needs to be um, more opportunity for the, winemakers to, um, how would I say it, um, uh, experiment more. Um, I think I think we sort of unfortunately held back by the VQA panel. I think, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen, like, if we look at Australia, for example, about four years ago, they got rid of their panel. And four years ago, you couldn't find Australian wines in a wine list. Today, all of a sudden, we're starting to see Australian wines in the wine list. And I attribute a lot of that to the Australian winemakers now being able to experiment a lot more. So I'm, I, I'm very much in favor of, of, of getting rid of a tasting panel because at this stage, the tasting panel was good. It got our wines up, Ontario wines up to a standard. But at this point, it's time for the winemakers to be able to determine what the terroir says and not the bureaucrats. Interesting. That's really fast. good, good insight. We are already at seven o'clock, so we've had a great conversation. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention now? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, as looking at the Canadian wine industry and where we are, and I think, you know, we're, we're in a very, very blessed place uh, where we make, uh, where we have food climbers and made soils. And, and I, I encourage everyone to drink as much Canadian wine as possible. Uh, whether it's from BC or it's from here. Uh, and then the other industry that I think really needs our great support, in this, and I see a complete parallel with the wine industry, is getting Canadians to eat Canadian cheeses. Mm. And we make amazing cheeses in this country. And I know why we don't, because cheese is, uh, is often like a special occasion uh, event. And what do we do? We buy cheese of great memories when we're in Italy and France, so we buy those cheeses. But we should be we should be more open to it, like we like we everyone's starting to eat uh, drink more Canadian wines. And trust me, I love everyone to drink Canadian wine every night. Um, we we're going in the right direction with that, and I hopefully they will uh, people will change their mind about Canadian cheeses, which have amazing cheeses as well. Absolutely. Wow. What a good note to end on. So where can we get in touch with you online? Um, how best can we find you in the winery and order your wines, Norm? Well, our, our website is fairly easy. We, we, we kept it simple, normanhardy.com and hardywithnaie.com. Okay. Uh, we also um, have some very good distribution in the LCBO. Mm -hmm. Not all our wines, but in, in the major stores, you can find our wines as well. And then, you know, as I said, Come to Prince Edward County, come to Niagara, well, certainly come to Prince Edward County, it's my winery. But finding Great Ontario wine is a great way to go, is to go and visit the wine country. And, and you know, we're so close. Uh, you don't have to fly to Europe. Come and sit on my patio, have some pizza, drink some wine, and you don't have to go all the way to Naples. What? There's no excuse, folks. There is no excuse. And the best part, the best part, when you go home, you don't have to go past immigration with that case of wine in your car. Yes. No questions. You can stay home to your basement for your, enough for your charge, but free of extra taxes. There you go. See, what more do you need? <laughs> really? Norm, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and, oh, and for great. your time. Great stories, great questions and answers. I mean, I, I feel like we've learned a lot tonight about Prince Edward County, and there's a reason why you have that cult following. So I appreciate this, and, and we do. Thank My you. My pleasure. Happy Sunday. All right. Take care. Right, take care. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.
Okay, guys, I'm going to stay online for a bit longer now. Um, that, wow, what a great conversation. If you would take a moment right now, post in the comments below, what is the most interesting thing that you learned tonight? I would love to know because I go back to these chats and things and look at your comments. Norm will be back in here, by the way, and talking about... Um, or answering your questions, that sort of thing. Uh, so please, uh, even if you're watching the replay, post your comments and questions. What single thing did you find most valuable about tonight's conversation? I'd love to know. If you've still got a question, post it below for Norm. He'll be back in here tonight or tomorrow. Um, also, next week, we will be joined by Caroline LeBlanc, Caroline LeBlanc from Torres Winery in Chile. Sorry, Spain, Spain, Torres. They do have some wineries in Chile, but um, a terrific winery. Completely different focus next week, so you're not gonna wanna miss that. At 6 p.m. Eastern, Toronto, New York time. Um, what else? You can always find upcoming episodes and previous episodes on the link that I've posted below. And I'd love to know if you have suggestions for upcoming guests. I would love to know. What should we cover? What should we be doing? Um, and lastly, if you've enjoyed this conversation, if you found value, if you think even one friend of yours would love to, to watch the replay, please take a moment to share our video. That's that little arrow that does this. It really helps get, the, get this video into the newsfeed of everyone who loves wine. It, uh, it encourages me as a juice monkey to keep doing this sh these shows for you. And uh, I just think more people need to know about this. Like, we're having some great conversations here. Let's share it. So share. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you putting uh, us into your calendar on Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern, New York, Toronto time. We go live every Sunday. It's a regular thing. It's informal. Pour yourself a glass of wine. Join us here, and I will see you next week. Take care.